Rathor, third year scholar of Shamlal College, University of Delhi. Uh, Shamlal College evening actually. Okay, now I take the privilege of today's moderation and it is a pleasure also to welcome you all to this another informative evening to this platform graduate scholars talk series. Now, uh, it is a graduate oriented platform, which is uh, uh, like which do personality development on a professional level providing by providing a stage with freedom of academic thoughts and uh, GSTS doesn't know extinction. All it knows is the practical continuous change and by providing scholars inclusive communications, it also strengthens the idea of inclusive classrooms. And like, I'm very thankful uh, to the moderators, like to the members, to the moderators and to all the team, uh, starting with the, the a person with determined visions and the aspirations, Dr. Manish Karwar, sir, who is the founder and advisor of this initiative. Also, uh, the moderators of Graduate Scholars Talk Series, Mr. Shubham Tiwari, Mr. Saurabh Singh, Mr. Ajay Gupta, Ms. Samriddhi Kanpal, Ms. Manvi Saraswat, Mr. Manthan, and me, myself. And we, the team members of GSTS, like I'm very thankful to them because they do all the necessary connections, which is very important uh, for this uh, initiative to happen on every Sunday. We have achieved 150 talks till yet and the initiative with a non-stop upcoming uh, informative evenings will pave a uh, way forward for many more scholars. Now, I would like to invite uh, today's uh, guest of honor to in, uh, for today's session. And for this, I would like to welcome Ms. Priyanka Sharma, ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, welcome to our initiative and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much like for taking time out of your busy schedule and you join us today. So we are, thank we are very, very thankful for that. Um, so Ma'am is an assistant professor at uh, Satyabhati College Evening. And uh, Ma'am has been like hailing from the scenic landscapes, uh, landscapes of Rajauri, Jambu and Kashmir. And uh, she stands as a beacon of inspiration, being the first girl from her village to pursue higher education. Her academic journey is nothing short of remarkable with her profound research in political science, leading to a transformative PhD uh, journey at the esteemed University of Delhi. Beyond her academic uh, progress, uh, ma'am has uh, unwavering commitment to societal upliftment as well, particularly focusing on empowering girls through education in her native village. Her dedication to making a difference is evident in her extensive work experience, including impactful roles such, in, such as an assistant professor at Satyavati College, a volunteer of COVID-19 relief work, and a citizen historian with the 1947 Partition Archive in collaboration with Stanford University Libraries. She has not only contributed significantly to academia with her papers on regional autonomy and sericulture, but also graced numerous national and international conferences with her thought-provoking presentations. Her list of uh, accolades and achievements as extensive with numerous awards recognizing her academic excellence and leadership qualities. Ma'am, uh, again, welcome. And uh, I want to start with your initial remarks. Also, uh, we want uh, uh, your note to start this event further. Namaste, good evening everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, thank you so much for such a generous introduction. I'm truly honored. And uh, I'll just keep my remarks for the end. Right now, I think we should just directly begin with the talk. So uh, shall we kindly begin the talk? Uh, okay, thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, we'll be waiting for your final remarks as well. Now, uh, before calling our speaker, just little uh, housekeeping. Be, uh, kindly, like, I just want to request everybody to kindly type your questions uh, in the chat box um, and uh, I'll pick them up during Q&A round. So now without, now without, a without further ado, let's invite uh, today's speaker, 
मोहम्मद शेम्स खान एंड ही इज अ ज्वाइंट ही इज फ्रॉम डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इंग्लिश अलीगढ़ मुस्लिम यूनिवर्सिटी ऑल्सो ही इज अ ज्वाइंट सेक्रेटरी ऑफ रैली I am I'm sorry if I'm like pronouncing it wrong. Really, literary society, and uh, he is uh, today's speaker. So, uh, uh, Mr. Shams, now the stage is all yours. You could go ahead with your presentation. Thank you so much, Shalindra, for inviting me. Um, just let me uh, share my screen. Okay. I hope it is visible. Uh yeah, right. Okay. Here we go. Um Before we proceed with uh, the 151st talk of graduate scholar talk series, I would uh, take this opportunity. I would take this opportunity to uh, thank the uh, the entire organizing team of graduate scholar talk series housed at Shamnal College Evening in the University of Delhi, and I also am honored to present this uh, talk in front of Miss Priyanka Sharma, our esteemed guest of honor from Satyavati College, again University of Delhi. with that being said um i would like to talk on a palette of perspectives indian colors on colonial canvas uh before we proceed for this particular talk uh, allow me to uh, put forward the rationale as to why i chose uh this particular theme why i chose to talk on this particular theme the reason being you see i am a literature student and i am very thankful that i am uh, i am a part as of now uh, of a history department so literature and history as far as in indian context is concerned we have uh, so many roots in common and colonialism is one aspect is one field where uh, both of us are uh, engaged in teaching research uh, and learning so that is why and also uh, for us as as a post colonial country as a post colonial nation uh, having uh, known our colonial identity and what went through the people of whom we are uh, a fruit of uh, went through so this uh, so this is why i chose this particular topic and uh, i would like to begin the talk uh my talk focuses on two very evident phrases in the title itself that is palette of perspectives and indian colors on colonial canvas uh to generalize one could arrive at an art class where palette colors and canvas reign but i would like to sketch something else my talk engages on literary perspectives uh, held by select colonial writers on british raj you see literature is a mirror where uh, the writers they 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 imprint what they observe in their outer surroundings and what is absorbed within their hearts and souls and minds so literature is that product uh, of of uh, ongoing uh, uh, ongoing developments uh, uh, you know surrounding us so this is how the writers were able to pen down something which they observed is very very exotic because you see this particular talk will focus on how the writers hailing from the west talk about the indic elements of the indic civilization when i say indic civilization i talk about the entire subcontinent that was there during the british raj what are we going to uh, talk about in this particular talk uh we will be looking at the presence of india indian and indianness in the works of writers we'll also be looking forward to the influence of indian knowledge system on them and the perception of colonial writers on indian thought and philosophy moving forward with the aspects of hinduism buddhism vedanta and other spiritual dimensions in their writings with that being said i'll i'll go on to the last point as well with that being said allow me to put one thing before you all that when we talk about something written something written aesthetically that is literature we are not going to be very critical of it because you see what what a literary writer writes 
happens to be his or her own observation. So he or she could be wrong. He or she could be right. So as of now, I would request all of you to be to to celebrate what has already been written rather than uh, critically examine it. Then moving forward, we'll also understand how the Indian thought resonated in the global audience. Now, these are the few literatures that I have chosen. Before uh, uh, we talk about these literary writers, uh, you see, when the uh, when books like uh, Bhagavad Gita, Vishnu Puran, um, you know, Hitopdesh and Panchatantra reached the audience, like the Western audience, and when books reached uh, Rolf Waldo Emerson, Walt Whitman, or, or Thomas Thoreau, their effect on them was immediate and inspiring. That process of cultural interaction and influence has continued since then. And their, the Indian ideas and ideals are channeled through their writings. So for this particular session, we have taken six writers into consideration. Those are Rolf Waldo Emerson, Herman Hees, Leo Tolstoy, W.B. Yeats, Octavio Paz, and T.S. Eliot. This does not mean, and we shall not construe that only six writers were there who wrote about India or Indianness or Indian culture, art and language. There are so many others available, but why have I chosen? Because these six writers were the one who were there as a part of India's colonial history. So they were also there when colonialism was at peak in India. Let us move forward. Now, let us come to the very first writer that we have on our plate, that is Rolf Waldo Emerson. Uh, Rolf Waldo Emerson uh, is an American transcendentalist, poet and essayist. Uh, his interest in Indian thought and philosophy uh, draws from a very young age when he was uh, 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 exposed to uh, Indian, uh, uh, Indian poetry and philosophy. And he was a very great fan of Kalidas, uh, Kalidasa's uh, plays like Abhigan Chakuntalam and also of the Vedantic philosophy. Uh, Vedanta uh, in uh, Western terminology uh, is seen as a reaffirmation of transcendentalism. Let us move forward to what he wrote about India. Now, this is a poem Brahma that he published in 1856, just a year before 1857. And Priyanka ma must be knowing it because there are so many other things that were going around that time, very much politically uh, heated, heated uh, uh, time it was. So he writes, they recall ill who leave me out when me they fly. I am the wings. I am the doubter. I am the doubt. I am the hymn the Brahmin sings. The strong gods pine for my abode and pine in vain the sacred seven. But thou, meek lover of the good, find me and turn thy back on heaven. Now, this poem is said to have uh, written by Rolf Waldo Emerson when he was, uh, uh, when he was uh, exposed to some, uh, uh, some Vedantic texts uh, in translation. Now, in this particular poem, these are the last two stanzas of the entire poem Brahma that was written in four stanzas, of course, obviously. Uh, he talks, he, he actually uh, narrates uh, how Brahma would have said. Now, when he says that I am the doubter and the doubt, and I am the hymn the Brahman sings. So basically, uh, Emerson is trying to inculcate one thing that Brahma, that is the creator of the universe in the uh, Indic mythology, uh, says to its people that the strong gods pine for my abode, that even there are some gods and there are, there are some gods who are waiting for Brahma, Brahma's place to come and have some residence there and pine in vain the sacred seven. And you see, there is also this concept of uh, Sapta Rishi in Indic mythology. And also uh, along with those gods like uh, Agni and Yama, that is God of fire and God of uh, death, respectively, along with the Sapta Rishi, they are trying to seek some place uh, uh, where I live or where I reside. But thou, meek lovers of the good. Now, meek lovers of the good is very beautifully written because you see, what we as human beings do, we are, you see, we follow religion, but we follow religion for the sake of attaining heaven, for the sake of getting place in heaven. But well, this, is a, this is a thing to be questioned. Do we do some good? Do we do something which uh, uh, makes us uh, relevant to have a place in heaven? So meek lover of the good, 
find me and turn thy back on heaven so he says that you see rather than uh, eyeing at uh, heaven you must do some good and uh, then and turn thy back turn your back on heaven so this was how Rolf Waldo Emerson uh, had an idea of India. Moving forward, we have uh, Hermann Hesse. Now, Hermann Hesse is a German Swiss poet, novelist, and painter. Uh, his paintings also had so many elements of uh, uh, Brahminic uh, elements. Uh, he got Nobel Prize in Literature in 1946. Uh, and also, uh, this, this must be mentioned that he wrote Siddhartha in 1918. Uh, with, with ostensibly with the aim of expounding the tenets of Buddhism in the West. Now, if we were to analyze the syllabi of various departments of English all over the country, we will find Siddhartha, the novel, as a mention for the undergraduate and even in some places at the postgraduate levels. Because this particular novel, Siddhartha, talks about, talks about, first handedly about how a German writer, you see, India has had a colonial past, so we were directly linked with the Britishers, but how a German uh, looked up to us. So this is how what Siddhartha tells us. So uh, this is what he wrote in uh, his reminiscences of India because he was once traveling to the country. But more beautiful than this was what we could see of the people. A Hindu's dreamy gait, a fragile Sinhalese tender sad and beautiful hazel look. The dazzling white of an eyeball in black Tamilikudi's eye, a noble Chinnaman's smile, a beggar's stammering in a strange dialect, being understood without any words among 10 different peoples and languages, and everywhere the strange and happy family that all men are equal, our brothers and sisters, our companions. This old and little truism that there is only one mankind was the most important impression for me. And after World War I, it has become even more valuable. Now you see, here is a direct mention of how Indian culture works. We do not see whether someone has a lower strata in the society or whether someone belongs to a very upper class uh, strata in the society. Uh, the, the mention of a, bag, of a beggar uh, getting uh, something you know, from the people with a stammering, strange dialect. It, you know, the, 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 the strange dialect of Pega, it does not stop people in contributing to for his uh, food and other necessities. So, so is the case that all men are equal. They are brothers and sisters and our old companion. And I think we all must adhere with this idea that despite of anything, we all are equal. We are brothers and sisters and our companions in good and bad times. So, this old and little truism of what uh, Herman he talks about is that there is only one mankind and it is the most valuable impression for him. And after World War I, when uh, men were after men, it was tooth for tooth and eye for an eye, uh, this expression that, you know, one mankind uh, has become even more valuable. Next, we have Leo Tolstoy, yeah, well, a very, uh, a very well-known and renowned poet, not only in the Soviet Russia, but also uh, in India. You see, he's a Russian writer. He's a pioneer of Russian realism. And it is very strange, but uh, he was nominated for Nobel Prize in Literature uh, for straight four consecutive years from 1902 to 1906, and also for Nobel Peace Prize in 1902 and 1909. But due to some um, of his uh, socialistic ideals, uh, he wasn't able to clear the race. Now, his ideas of nonviolent resistance are very much popular, not only in Russia, but it is also said that Mahatma Gandhi, the father of our nation, has also was also inspired by Tolstoy's ideas of nonviolent resistance. What he believed was uh, to to make the enemy. Uh, mellow down by love. And so was the idea and ideal of uh, Mahatma Gandhiji. So he edited, translated and composed a number of texts and about Buddha and his teaching, including the 19, uh, 1889 essay, Siddhartha called the Buddha, that is the Holy One. Now you see, Siddhartha, in this particular essay, there is this person, the, the character is Siddhartha and he's in search of Buddha. 
Okay, so at the end, uh, he attains uh, uh, salvation, and uh, Lord Buddha he himself calls Siddhartha, and uh, he then says that okay, so your uh, uh, your uh, worship is over, and uh, now you can attain salvation. So this is actually a dialogue between a devotee and uh, and the worship the worshipper and one who is being worshipped. So Tolstoy, uh, he wrote a letter to Hindu. Basically, this letter is said to be written to Mahatma Gandhi ji in 1908. And he says that if the people of India are enslaved by violence, it is only because they themselves live and have lived by violence and do not recognize the eternal law of love inherent in humanity. Now, he he questions and he, he is a bit polemic uh, to divide and rule policy of uh, the British and how Indians are unable to uh, chalk it out or Indians are unable to, you know, segregate, uh, you know, false and the truth. So he says that, you see, uh, you people, this is not what Britishers are uh, being violent to you. You yourself are being violent to each other. Okay, so there is one community standing against another community and two are fighting. So he, he moves on. You, he says that love is the only way to rescue humanity from all else. And in it, you have the only method of saving your people from enslavement. So at the end of the day, Tolstoy too talks about, uh, you know, humanity and its inherent relationship with love. Because you see, where there is love, there is peace. And it is also said that peace is where justice is. So in a way, also in his letter, he says that, you know, where there is love, there is justice. So there would be nobody harming nobody. There would be, you know, peace, harmony, and, you know, there'll be a harmonious coexistence between people. Okay, so when we talk about Tolstoy, we must remember that he was not very much directly related to the Brahmic uh, elements or the um, Indic elements but, or, or Buddhism to that extent. But he was uh, very much uh, impressed by the idea of uh, non-violence and, uh, you know, sharing love with all. Now, next is, uh, he's also one of my favorite poets, W.B. Yeats, William Butler Yeats. He's an Irish poet, dramatist and writer. Uh, the pioneer of Irish literary revival, also called the Celtic Revival. In 1923, he was awarded Nobel Prize in Literature. And uh, with the, uh, in 1904, uh, he, he founded the Abbey Theatre, uh, which has produced some very interesting uh, uh, theatre performances and some very interesting writers, were uh, dramatists, I must say, were represented at the Abbey Theatre. So he wrote, uh, now there's this friend, you see, this is, uh, this is not a poem, rather it's a poem of friendship. Now there was this uh, Mohu Mohini Chatterjee. Now he was an Indian philosopher, he was a Vedantic philosopher, he had so much knowledge on uh, uh, Indian Vedas and uh, you know uh, Upanishads and Puranas as well. So Mohu Mohini Chatterjee, he went to Dublin in, 1920, in 1918 some, uh, during this time and he gave a lecture. And then this impressed W.P. Yeats to, some, to such extent that he wrote a poem in, uh, in honor of uh, Mohini Chatterjee. And the title of the poem, he kept it as Mohini Chatterjee because he wanted that when uh, future generations will read his works, his friend's name must also be read with his. So this also indicates the theme of friendship uh, uh, the writer is trying to imply. So if we were to read out, you know, I must go with the last uh, uh, five lines of the second part. Grave is heaped from grave, that they be satisfied over the blackened earth. The old troops parade, birth is heaped on birth, that such cannonade may thunder time away, birth are and death are meet, or as great sages say, men dance on deathless feet. So Mohini Chatterjee was, uh, uh, you see, and if we go by some uh, some more lines, so he says that Mohini Chatterjee spoke these or words like these. So it was Mohini Chatterjee's words which uh, W.B. Yeats uh, uh, wrote and uh, wrote for uh, obviously the Western population. But it is, it is also, um, uh, it is also uh, uh, you know, uh, attractive for the uh, Oriental scholars uh, like us uh, to have uh, to, to attend it. Moving forward, uh, we have Octavio Paz, a Mexican poet and writer, a career diplomat, 
Nobel Prize in Literature in 1990. Now he's also a very interesting person. He was not a writer at first. He was uh, well a civil servant of Mexico, and uh, he was appointed uh, in 1962. He was appointed as the Mexico's ambassador to India, and uh, in 1952, his his father was also an ambassador to India. So in 1952. he came to india with his father and he was quite young he was a teenager then and he was quite young and when he came here he went he went to mathra and when he went to mathra the the scenic beauty the colors uh, and uh, and it was i think it was the holy time so uh, mathra was uh, in in full colorful mode and uh, during this time he wrote like uh, he wrote an uh, a poem called uh, mathra and that's a spanish poem i couldn't find the uh, translation of that particular poem but we'll soon uh, uh, try to have it uh, this is what he wrote in a preface to the double flame in 1995 and before that in light of india in 1990 now around 1965 while i was living in india the nights were as blue and electric as those of the poem that sings of the loves of krishna and radha i fell in love I decided to write a little book on love taking as its point of departure the intimate connections between the three domains sex eroticism and love it would be an exploration of emotory feeling i made a few notes but had to stop pressing tasks tasks claimed my attention and forced me to postpone the project i left india now in 1965 when he came as i said he came to uh, mathra and he was very much uh, you know flabbergasted i must say <laughs> with the colors and the colorful uh, happenings that were there uh, during that time he again writes in one of his another essays in 1990 he wrote in light of india he says 11 years later in 1962 i returned to india as the ambassador of my country from my country I stayed a little more than six years. It was a happy time. I could read. I wrote several books on poetry and prose. I had a few friends with whom I shared aesthetic, ethical, and intellectual affinities. I could travel through unfamiliar cities in the heart of Asia, witness strange customs, gaze on monuments and landscapes. Most of all, it was there. It was there that I met my future wife, Marie Jose, and that, and there that we were married. I, it was a second birth so he actually tells how india holds so much importance and why india is so much close to his hearts because you see marriage is also well he says it a second birth uh, some of you might not agree <laughs> okay so he uh, basically says that because it is a place where he met his future wife mari hose and it is also a place where he could read write learn make connections and you know go for some aesthetic ethical and intellectual tastes so this is why india holds a very very important place place uh, in his uh, Uh, writings now one of my favorites <laughs> ts elliot and those who are from uh, uh, from my department uh, in this meet uh, we have had a great relation with uh, thomas stearns elliot ts elliot uh, he was a poet essayist publisher playwright critic uh, and so much more on the plate uh, keep all the synonyms uh, one can have uh, he he is the pioneer of modern english poetry and uh, he, he got awarded a nobel prize in literature in the year 1948 now his relationship with indian asian philosophy and philology and patanjali's metaphysics and buddhist studies is world renowned and let me put it here and i must mention that Uh, his essay uh, on metaphysical uh, uh, elements in literature i'm unable to call out the title but he, it is a very very famous essay in the metaphysics of poetry i guess and uh, it, it is said that uh, a lot of uh, content of that essay he has drawn from patanjali's metaphysics he had famously remarked that the intellectual subtleties of the great indian philosophers made most of the great european philosophers look like a schoolboy now thomas stearns eliot ts eliot was the one who was there in the early 1920s and as a student of history you all must be aware uh, and also as a student of literature we all must be aware that there was one person called thomas macaulay <laughs> who said that uh, you know uh, the entire literature of asia available in arab and arabic and sanskrit is just like one tiny bookshelf in an in an english library so this is you see this is how it took a, it took them a century to realize that most of the great european scholars look like a schoolboy and it is said that you know western philosophers uh, borrowed a lot from eastern philosophers from the oriental philosophers now 
a very fo- famous poem of his and um, uh, the wasteland he got published in 1922 we just celebrated uh, 100 years of public publication of uh, the wasteland uh, the wasteland ends it, it starts with the uh, april is the cruelest month because uh, it was written after the world war 1 and it, which occurred in april but it ends with tatta tyadvam damyat shanti 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 so this particular uh, couplet has been taken originally from uh, chapter 5 of uh, brihadayank upanishad and he talks about and it, this is actually a very uh, a very evident portrayal a very evident it is it is an evidence rather to make us all realize that how close was a uh, uh, thomas eliot uh, with the sanskritic philosophy and sanskritic traditions and uh, wasteland i must say that has uh, uh, phrases from uh, 27 languages altogether and sanskritic elements are those which have the most part in uh, you know a framing of wasteland throughout the 19th and 20th centuries a notable cohort of influential thinkers spanning different cultural backgrounds became deeply enamored with indian spiritual thought you see rolf waldo emerson and henry david thoreau key figures in the 19th century transcendentalist movement dwelled into indian poetry and philosophy finding resonance with vedanta and hindu concepts herman hesse a 20th century german swiss novelist drew from his exposure to hinduism and buddhism during his formative years evident in acclaimed works of siddhartha coming to leo tolstoy a russian novelist in a period of personal crisis turned to buddhism translating texts and advocating non violence based on indian spiritual principles these intellectual currents continued with figures like w b yeats t s eliot and octavio paz who e- who each in their unique way incorporated hindu and buddhist philosophies into their works reflecting a cross cultural fertilization of ideas that transcended geographical boundaries and time periods and i must mention that you see each of the six Uh, writers or uh, poets that we uh, took into consideration today were from very very distinct uh, you know uh, locations on earth uh, leo tolstoy was a russian octavio paz was a mexican ts eliot was a british w b yeats was an irish he was from ireland and rolf waldo emerson was an you know uh, uh, hailed from uh, the americas so you see it is nothing like that a particular section or a particular uh, boundary of people are talking about you know the oriental and we only looked to one one thing that is the uh, influence of indic uh, civilization on uh, the western writers you see even some other civilizations had have a great uh, impact on uh, western writers so this was all from myself uh, on the topic palette of perspectives indian colors and colonial canvas many thanks to gsts organizing committee Thank you so much. Thank you all. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Shams. It was really wonderful. It was very informative, uh, wonderfully depicted and illustrated. And people really want to listen to such kind of topics because at the back of the title, these topics are somehow related uh, with the authentication of culture. So they really want to listen it. And I hope that our audience will get so much, so much more information. आपके इस प्रेजेंटेशन से नाउ वी हैव सम क्वेश्चंस फ्रॉम आवर ऑडियंस फॉर यू सो लेट्स टेक देम वन बाय वन द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज बाय मिस कोमल एंड शी इज आस्किंग दैट टू व्हाट एक्सटेंट डिड द इन्फ्यूजन ऑफ इंडियन कलर्स इन कॉलोनियल आर्ट कंट्रीब्यूट टू द ब्रॉडर डिस्कोर्स ऑन कल्चरल हाइब्रिडिटी एंड कॉम्प्लेक्सिटीज ऑफ कॉलोनियल आइडेंटिटी okay so to what extent the infusion of indian colors in colonial art contribute you see um, basically when we talk about uh, the visual arts or, or to say the art of india with that of the west you see indian indian colors indian artistic system indian artistic values are very much different from that of west because the west they, they focused more on minimalism uh, they focused more on some you know mundane and baroque you know the themes of more baroque than ours uh, the thing is that you see if we talk about abanendranath tagore's painting of uh, bharat mata which was very which was very renowned and it was uh, often uh, you know uh, cited by people so 
uh, in the west the i cannot comment on their artistic styles but yes i as a, as a as a student of literature i can uh, surely say that inclusion of the you know uh, the color scheme of that what indian uh, artists follow basically having uh, red uh you know orange or yellow or, or you know some very uh, harsh shades or uh, you know some very bright shades that was not present in uh, uh, uh the western art okay mm-hmm. uh, and now next question is by uh, ms samriddhi and she is asking that in what ways have colonial history and cultural exchange influenced the reception and interpretation of indian philosophies in the west now you see this is a very very uh, double sided question why because you see i i when i was preparing for my talk i came across so many writers which for the i heard for the very first time were very very <laughs> generous when it came to my <laughs> country were very generous when it came to india now if you talk about rudyard kipling oh my god such a naughty writer he he wrote uh, uh, this uh, book kim um and he also uh, again coming about uh, talking about uh, richard francis burton uh, i have his book uh, goa and the blue mountains it was published in 1851 the very first book and richard burton is the one who translated alf lela wa lela from uh, from uh, arabic into english so he and he was also very much critical about the entire race he said that we are dogs i'm so sorry to say <laughs> okay so uh, the uh, colonial you see if you talk about cultural exchanges it was more over like you see some people had a very diverse a very adverse view of ourselves while others were very much uh, 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 very much affectionate about and and you know, such people those who are affectionate are very less so you can have around 20 25 writers and scholars from western countries those who wrote about india you see if such was not the case the entire discourse of post colonial studies wouldn't have arrived at the first place okay uh, there is one more question from uh, like uh, like i want to ask this question mm-hmm. that how can understanding like the interplay uh, between the indian ethos and the like, western thought contribute to the more uh, inclusive understanding of the human experience ha huh, that is a very nice question rather you see it it hints that borders cannot part human beings we can create borders i can make some other you know Brit- what britishers did they divided india okay what britishers did they divided ireland also so they have divided they are such divisive power oh my god so the thing is that even if uh, you know there are some parties present within the western countries those who are so much those who those who have some level of sanity left and those who are very much a uh, particular about human humanity and humanistic values that if and they they do not fear calling a spade a spade that and sadly this is not present in india of this time okay so we fear calling a spade a spade so if we were to say something that is happening wrong we have to see like this like that left right and center and then we have to see whether it's an appropriate position and appropriate time to say things okay so the the western thoughts on indian system or indian knowledge system has uh, made us arrive to a conclusion that if something is to be appreciated it has to be appreciated you must not be a british a, a man of color a man of white you know to appreciate something which which has some qualities that are to be put into light i hope this clears okay uh, now there is one more question uh, mm-hmm. which is from our platform and we always ask this question to all our speakers that mm-hmm. uh, what was your experience with this platform and what do you like what are your ideas uh, regarding this initiative oh <laughs> you will make me emotional rather <laughs> that, that is such a tough question you see um uh, a recent graduate like me i completed my uh, ba honors in english from the department of english at aligarh muslim university this year only and now i am enrolled in mfa program so uh, for me to be invited as a speaker you know it is it is i think one of the very first time it is happening okay i have been to conferences both here outside like india and abroad but uh, giving space to some very young scholars You see, it is not that I will be getting some fame. There could be like my PRO office in my university will come with a news report that the MU student presented a talk on this this topic. But you see, it motivates others. 
And I am very much sure that if someone from who has joined from my place is listening to me now and who is my junior and I have some wonderful juniors, okay, so, so they will also take inspiration in honing up their speaking skills, in researching their uh, topics, in finding platforms where they can, uh, uh, you know, present their views. Okay, so you see, people at the age of 20 and 21 and 22, if they are given a platform to share their ideas, you see what else they could have asked for. And what else they could have been bestowed with. Okay. So I congratulate all of you. And this is such a, you know, great idea from the part of uh, the organizers to give chance to some young scholars, those who are uh, eager to share their ideas. Thank you so much, GSTS. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Shams. And once again, congratulations for such a, a wonderful presentations you have made today. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, proceeding further, it's time to invite uh, uh, today's guest of honor, uh, like Ms. Priyanka, ma'am, again for her final remarks, which she has been waiting since long. So, uh, ma'am, <laughs> kindly give her you uh, give us your final remarks over today's topic, over uh, like today's uh, presentation, and over this initiative as well. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I really want to thank uh, GSTS uh, and uh, Professor Karamwar for having me uh, today. And uh, also, uh, I really, you know, I'm, I'm actually feeling very blessed to be part of this uh, intellectual exchange. And um, I want to take this opportunity to also congratulate Sir for uh, and the team of GSTS for completing their 150 talks and. Uh, it actually, uh, yeah, it actually, you know, it's a, we can say it's a testament to the dedication to the learning and the growth. And uh, um, it's uh, really, um, it's really honor for me to be uh, a part of it and uh, to be a guest of honor here. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, and uh, I really want to thank Mr. Khan for such a beautiful presentation, for such, uh, you know, enriching uh, presentation. And uh, you have um, presented this beautiful uh, palette of uh, perspectives in front of us. And uh, uh, indeed, what you said, uh, of course, uh, the impact of Indian knowledge systems on uh, literature across various cultures is profound and far reaching. And uh, we see that uh, it serves, uh, the Indian knowledge system has actually served as an inspiration and uh, it has actually provided different perspectives to the diverse literatures out there. So I'm no expert of this field, but uh, definitely your presentation has actually added, added into my knowledge also. And I'm pretty sure it must have added to, into the knowledge of everyone who is listening and everyone who will be listening it on other platforms. And uh, apart from that, um, the one thing that I really want to Actually, I am working on politics of knowledge in uh, development. So uh, I, I was just trying to relate this uh, presentation with that. You know, we as a researchers, we always try to do that. So in a way, when we broadly talk about this major theme of decolonizing the, uh, decolonizing the knowledge systems and all that, so uh, what uh, one basic, you know, thing that we can see here is that the Indian knowledge systems do actually represent this rich uh, uh, tapestry of uh, cultural and intellectual heritage. And it, you know, encompass from uh, like there are various fields from mathematics to Ayurveda to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, broadly medicine or to architecture to other fields. It's It actually encompass all these fields. And... Um, when we talking on all these topics, it's not just, uh, you know, we're not just trying, in a way, we're not just trying to do historical ratification, but also moving towards cognitive justice, where we trying to, uh, in a way, we also trying to uh, look at the cognitive validity of all these knowledge systems which are out there. And I feel that the present problems that the world is facing right now, if we do not move towards pluralistic knowledge systems, uh, uh, if we do not move towards, uh, you know, uh, a system where all the knowledge systems actually uh, have their own uh, cognitive validity and we do celebrate those and uh, then uh, it would be you know a bit difficult to actually face these problems and uh, uh, these knowledge systems and especially here we are talking about Indian knowledge systems it, it is a very valid and very you know a good alternative that we have right now and uh, I think we really need to uh, look at the epistemic, uh, you know, validity of these and uh, 
uh, we should uh, look uh, try to look at the we should not try to superiorize any of this but then uh, of course we need to look at the very superiority that it holds so thank you so much for having me thank you so much i'm really really honored thank you so much sir <laughs> Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, thank you so much for putting such uh, knowledgeable remarks today. Uh, now, uh, proceeding further, it's time to invite uh, to be speaker, like a speaker for one fifty third, one fifty second talk uh, on upcoming Sunday, and for uh, uh, elaborating her introduction for upcoming talk, I would like to invite Miss Kirtana, and she is going to speak on the topic. the role of cultural traditions in preserving indigenous art and crafts in india on upcoming sunday so uh, if you are there you could go ahead with your objectives yeah thank you so much so greetings am i audible uh, yes yes you are perfect yeah, yeah. okay thank you greetings to everyone i am kirtana girish a student pursuing undergraduate studies in history and philosophy at gargi college university of delhi First of all I would like to take this opportunity to extend my gratitude to GSTS for creating such a marvelous and distinguished platform to give opportunity to enthusiasts like me and also for giving me a chance to present a talk. I'd also like to thank my professor for referring GSTS to me because I was not really unaware of GSTS existence before. Along with this I am also taking the liberty to appreciate today's speaker Mohit Shams because it would be a crime if I didn't do so because it was such a fantastically compiled and immensely knowledgeable session and I gained a lot of knowledge so thank you for that uh, moving on today I want to shed light on a topic of immense value in our current context in our fast paced globalized world cultural traditions art and craft forms often find themselves marginalized in the face of individualistic promotions pursuits and capitalist agendas in a country as diverse as india where cultural traditions art and craft form the essence of identity it becomes crucial for us to recognize their significance This presentation aims to explore the richness of India through its craft forms, highlighting their intricate connections with identity and delving into the role of culture, identity, and traditions for um, as protectors of indigenous art and craft in different regions. So, the topic, as mentioned, is cultural the role of cultural traditions in preserving indigenous art and crafts in India. With that being stated, I am moving on to my objectives. So, starting by I'd be presenting the introduction in which pro I pro I aim to provide a clear understanding of how cultural traditions are unique to different areas and constitute a significant part of an individual's or community's or society's identity. Then I would explain the importance of comprehending various cultural traditions in different regions to appreciate the significance of each craft forms. Then Following this I would be introducing selected craft forms from across India to make the audience familiar with the diversity of craft traditions setting the stage for the main discussion then analyzing the intricate relationship between art and craft traditions culture and identity to create studies of selected craft forms including the dokra art rogan art kanchipuram silk aranmula kannadi bidri wear and others which were selected with the sole aim that I'd be able to present the picture of a varied and diverse craft forms of india concluding the presentation i'll summarize the findings and insights gained from exploring the interplay between art craft traditions culture and identity and i also aim to share personal thoughts and ideas that i gathered from researching this topic through this presentation i hope i will be able to emphasize the significance of acknowledging and safeguarding indigenous art and craft forms through which we ensure the vibrancy of our cultures and their timeless existence for generation to come i humbly invite you all to take part in the next session for my presentation thank you uh thank you miss um, kirtana it is going to be absolutely going to be a really interesting uh, talk on next sunday so again a reminder to everyone join us uh, on next sunday where uh, miss kirtana will be addressing 152nd gsts now wrapping up uh, this session thank you so much everybody who has joined us today uh, uh, yeah okay so yeah thank you so much everybody who has uh, joined us today starting from uh, ma'am and then 